In the last video, I introduced you to the term obesity epidemic. But I left you with the notion that I was going to challenge the term obesity epidemic, and I was going to challenge the idea that obesity is a major cause of disease in the United States. Because epidemic would refer to a process that causes a large number of diseases across the population. Now, what I am not saying is that we have uh, a bunch of obese individuals in the United States. I agree with that. I agree that there are many obese individuals in the United States. And I want to show you these maps. These are from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is a data collection system from the Center of Disease Control just down here in Atlanta. And the Center for Disease Control at the state level has been uh, quantifying the trend of obesity in the United States. So this first map was from 1985. And what you can see is the states that are in light blue, these are going to be states that have a, about a 10% uh, obesity rate in their total population. The darker blue color, this is going to be a 10 to 14% uh, obesity rate in that state. And then white, just simply they haven't collected the data. And what you're going to see is eventually all states are going to be collecting data but we're also going to see this trend of increasing obesity at the state level as we go through each of these maps. And we're going to go through 1985 to 2010. So the first couple of years, you can see that we just have more and more states that are involved in the data collection process. Then in 1991, you can see that Michigan, West Virginia, Mississippi, and Louisiana are actually going to add a new category, this darker blue color, 15 to 19% of the total population in these four states now exceeds or, it, or is obese uh, compared to the total population. And you can see that trend continues for many states until 1997 when Indiana, Kentucky, and again Mississippi lead the nation in the number of obese individuals per unit of population in that state. By 2001, Mississippi, thank you, again, leading the way, 25% of the Mississippi population is considered obese by, 19, by 2001. 2002, West Virginia and uh, Alabama follow suit, Indiana, and then pretty soon almost the entire southeast and the state of Michigan are considered uh, obese, or 30, 25 to 29% of the population is obese. 2005, three states help us to add a new category, 30% of the population in West Virginia, Mississippi, and Louisiana. By 2010, you can see that every state in the nation has a population, a total population, that's at least 20% obese. In fact, by 2010, this is the last data that I have, all of the blue colors for 10, 10 to 14, and 15 to 19 percent are no longer even represented on the map. We completely changed the map, so now we only have these darker um, oranges and yellows and reds representing pretty high and pretty significant number of individuals in the state that are considered to be obese. So this definitely uh, is a, a good indication in the United States that we do have an obesity problem. But is it an obesity epidemic? And before we really get into that, I want to give you a few more pieces of information or a few more pieces of data to think about. So right now, nationally, the national average, about 60%, more than half of all Americans, would fall into a category of being either overweight or being obese. And in fact, overweight versus obese, about 30% of the population in the United States right now, today, about 30% are overweight, about 30% are obese. And there is a link that has been shown between obesity and other diseases. So there is a link between ob obesity and many other types of diseases. 
And so really the question becomes, if obesity is so prevalent in the United States, and it does seem to be associated with other diseases, what are the causes of obesity, and can we actually reduce those effects or reduce the, the uh, obesity in the United States by attacking the individual causes? So we're going to start out here with a discussion on the causes of obesity. So what is actually causing obesity? And in the scientific community, overwhelmingly, there are two different camps. And these two camps, in my mind, are actually mutually exclusive, meaning that if you're in one camp, you can't be in the other camp. You have to make a decision. So what could be causing obesity? What are the potential causes of obesity? One camp would say that the United States is overeating. So we are taxing our digestive systems to such an extent that we are over inundating our, our bodies with calories. And we're storing those calories and that is what's causing the obesity. The other camp is that we are overwhelmingly physically inactive. Now you could maybe try to argue that we both overeat and we're physically inactive, but the science is actually going to show that that's an impossibility. In fact, what the science is going to show is that only one of these camps is correct. So I want to take a look at the data that supports both of these camps. And we'll start with overeating. So if you talk to someone who's in the overeating category or in the overeating camp, and they say, yes, overeating is what's causing the obesity epidemic, they're going to tell you that in the United States, Americans consume on average about 400 extra calories each day. And this would be compared to 50 years ago. So that's pretty alarming if that's true. If we actually really, as Americans, are eating 400 extra calories a day, then absolutely overeating is the primary cause of obesity. But if we just step back from the data real quick and we just think about it logically, we can ask the question, is this logical? And I'm going to give you the simple answer. The simple answer is no, but I'm also going to show you why it is not logical. And I'm going to use simple math to do this. But don't worry, I'm not going to leave you with just simple math. I'm also going to give you a very good reason why this is not a logical estimate of how many more calories individuals consume today compared to 50 years ago. So simple math. If we're consuming 400 extra calories each day, and we take that by seven days, then that would state that on average, every American or the average American is consuming 2,800 extra calories every week compared to what we were consuming 50 years ago. Then if we take that 2,800 extra calories 2,800 extra calories per week, and we multiply it by 52 weeks out of the year, that's going to come up with 145,600 extra calories every year. Now, you may look at that and you may think, well, that doesn't really seem like it's a whole lot of extra calories. I typically consume about 2,000 calories a day. But let me put this into physiological perspective for you. If we look at one pound of body mass, and in particular one pound of fat, we would find that there's about 3,500 calories in each pound of mass. 
So I can simply take that 3,500 and divide it by the 145,600 calories, and I can give you an estimate of how many extra pounds the average American should put on each year. So the 145,000 extra calories a year divided by the 3,500 calories it takes to accrue one pound of mass. If I do the math there, that comes up with 41 pounds per year. So the average American, according to this data of we're consuming 400 extra calories a year, would equate to the average American gaining 41 pounds a year. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't individuals who have gained 41 pounds in a year. But what I'm saying is that that is so rare in the United States that it's hardly the average population. So my conclusion, based off of just this simple logical test, is to claim that Americans are consuming 400 extra calories a year is not logical. And since it's not logical, is there a way to... Or is there some way that we can look at this question and see where the error has come in? The number 400 extra calories a year is data that is based off of what's known as a recall survey. And this is a very common technique that's used in psychology. When we apply it to biological variables, however, it does not hold up. It's actually a very poor mechanism for quantifying physiological variables. So the 400 extra calories a day is based off of recall surveys. And the way that this happened is researchers approached individuals in the United States and they gave them a dietary recall survey or an opportunity to complete dietary recall surveys. Now these have very low estimating power. And what that means, very low estimating power, is that the amount of food that an individual claims that they consume with actually what they did consume, they don't line up very well. In fact, most humans overestimate how much food that they've consumed, the number of calories they consume. And the reason that is, is because of an inherent issue with recall surveys. The way that a recall survey is administered is I would approach an individual and I would give them the survey and that survey would ask them to recollect the number of calories or the food that they had consumed over the last 30 days. Now, most of you are probably thinking, wow, over the last 30 days, if you're like me, you probably don't even remember what you had for breakfast. And you probably can't accurately detail what you had for breakfast, much less what you had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner 30 days ago. And so this is where the error comes in. Now, there are actually more accurate methods than a dietary recall survey to estimate the amount of food that individuals are consuming. And we've actually applied those more accurate methods. By the way, just to give you another analogy here, this would like be like me walking into the room and saying, okay, I'm going to measure your body mass, and I just simply look at you and I guess your body mass. Now, you've all been to carnivals before, and you've seen the guy who guesses your body weight. Some of them can do really well. Some of them are very poor at it but it takes an individual who is well-trained to do that to be accurate. The memory of the human mind is not as powerful as would be required to accurately assess the dietary intake through a recall survey. So applying these more accurate methods, one of them is to just simply have them journal as they're consuming the food, they write down exactly what they're consuming. Another way is actually to measure the metabolic activity. And when we do that, use these more accurate measurements, the number that we should be working from for present day humans is that present day humans are consuming, consuming about 30 extra calories per day compared to 50 years ago. Now if you go through and do that same logical test and the same math, 
problem that I've already shown you. I'm just going to give you the body weight that's accumulated. This equates to about three pounds of extra body mass or body weight gained per year. Now this seems like it's much more realistic. Most of you probably have experienced three pounds of weight gain in a year and know people who have experienced three pounds of weight gain in a year. So based off of all of this information, it is actually very hard to conclude and the science does not support that overeating is the actual cause of the obesity epidemic. So overeating probably is not what causes this so quote unquote obesity epidemic. What was the other option? The other option is physical activity. Now, physical activity, how does this actually fit into um, the idea of digestive physiology and food consumption? Physical activity is a calorie utilizing exercise. In other words, the calories that we consume through physical activity negate the calories that are consumed in our diet. Now I want you to consider six individuals. And you actually can see these six individuals on the screen. And you're already kind of getting a hint to what's going on here. But these six individuals, I'm going to kind of organize this out for you in a slightly different way. They can either be active or inactive. In other words, they can partake in physical activity or they can neglect physical activity. And then the individual can be of normal weight on both sides, of overweight, or obese. So we have active normal, active overweight, and active obese individuals. And yes, there is such thing as an active obese individual. We have inactive normal weight individuals, inactive overweight individuals, and then inactive obese individuals. In these six individuals, we can evaluate their order of overall health. In other words, which of the individuals would be classified as more healthy? Now, when I do this in class, and you all can participate, I would have you order these six individuals based off of their overall health. And most people would go, well, the healthiest is that active normal weight individual, and then it's probably the inactive normal weight individual, then the active overweight, then the inactive overweight, then the active obese, and the inactive obese. Something like that. Or you might say, well, it's probably the individuals who are... Um, active or individuals who are inactive and you may give me a couple different options but most people look at it as strictly based off of body weight if you're normal weight you're healthier if you're overweight you're a little less healthy and if you're obese you're the most unhealthy regardless of your activity status but as you look here at this figure I'm illustrating on the board what you're going to find is the order of health does not follow body weight status but rather follows activity or fitness level. The more fit and active an individual, the lower the risk for relative disease. So on this figure, this individual here, the normal weight fit or normal weight active individual, has a relative risk for all types of mortality, all types of death by disease of one. And we're using that as the reference population. So definitely the best thing to be is normal weight and active. But notice as you go up this scale, if you are normal weight and you're unfit or unactive, inactive, you are 2.2 times more likely 
to die because of diseases than the individual who is normal weight and fit. And the way that this falls out is there's no additional relative risk for overweight or obese, a 1.1, so a tenth of, a, uh, of an increase in relative risk with body weight. If you remain active in those populations, your relative risk for all causes of mortality or all causes of death is much lower than the individuals who are inactive and unfit. And yes, the worst thing to be is obese and unfit. You have a 3.1 likelihood of dying compared to the individual who's normal and fit. So the overall order of health here doesn't differentiate on body weight, but rather differentiates on activity level. So based off of all of this, I am going to submit that physical activity and not really obesity or food consumption is one of the major causes of disease in the U.S. population. We really aren't consuming a whole lot more food than we did 50 years ago. A small amount, about 30 extra calories a day, about three pounds of additional body weight each year. But our physical activity levels have significantly decreased. As we've gone through the Industrial Revolution and we've uh, increased technology in society, more of us are becoming more physically inactive. We're sitting longer periods of time at desks at work or at school and not participating in activity near as much as we used to. As a result of this change in physical activity levels in the United States, we have seen increases in the rates of diseases over the last hundred years. In fact, so much so, the trend has been prevalent in the population that we now have a group of diseases that are just simply referred to as hypokinetic diseases. This is a group of diseases that are now emerging. And in fact, medical billing specialists, you can be diagnosed with hypokinetic disease. And hypokinetic diseases are actually diseases that you're all very familiar with. Just to give you some example of hypokinetic diseases, diseases that are more prevalent in an inactive population, it's going to include things like obesity and diabetes, heart disease, even certain types of cancer. Back problems are a major issue with people who are physically inactive. Uh, and there's a whole host of other diseases that have a, a low physical activity or a link to physical activity. So I am going to further submit to you today that inactivity is actually one of our leading causes of disease in the United States and that it really has very little to do with our eating habits and even our body weight, uh, our body weight as a population. If we are inactive, we are prone to disease. If we are active, we are protected from disease. Now, the CDC currently, um, there are two things that humans do that are very um, uh, prevalent in individuals that are uh, subjected to disease. One of them is physical inactivity, and this is the leading cause of actual death in the United States tied with one other habit. And you've probably already guessed that inactivity is going to be tied for uh, leader, leading cause of disease with smoking. So just in terms of how much does this actually cost us on an annual basis, the cost of physical inactivity is right around 39% of all U.S. medical costs. In terms of dollar amounts, because the United States were physically inactive as a population, we are spending about $390 billion every year on this poor habit. 
So it's not an issue with what we eat. It's not an issue with our body weight. It's an issue with how active we are. And the real questions that we need to ask for real change in healthcare in the United States is how do we get the American population to participate more frequently in physical activity?